Hello, I'm Jorge Gestoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, the United States and the coup in Venezuela. Our guest, Eugene Perrier, author, activist, and organizer with the Answer Coalition. Eugene Perrier, a uh, warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me again. Eugene, the U.S. was involved in the coup of Venezuela? Uh, the U.S. was extremely involved in the coup in Venezuela. I think they actually played the key role. The recognition of the so-called new government in Venezuela wouldn't have gained the same level of international credibility without the recognition by the United States. And we've seen, I think, time and again, Honduras was a similar situation, that really the, the starting gun for many right-wing governments around the world to acknowledge this so-called new government would not have taken place without the United States. So among many other things, I think just the role of recognition of this so-called new government was really the key role in pushing forward the possibility of a coup or the really ongoing uh, reality of a coup. Now we're going to see some reactions in the U.S. that uh, has already been published, if you want. There is an open letter uh, by over 70 scholars and experts that condemned the U.S. back coup attempt in Venezuela. And I want to quote what the, this, uh, this letter says, say, the U.S. and its allies must cease encouraging violence by pushing for violent extra-legal regime change, and continues and say, for the sake of the Venezuelan people, the region, and for the principle of national sovereignty, these international actors should instead support negotiations between the Venezuelan government and its opponents. Meaning that in the U.S. there's not just one voice, there are a lot of resistance to the decision of the government of Trump? Yes, I think in the United States, at least at the grassroots level, there is quite a bit of resistance. I think the one challenge is that not many of those people are in Congress, and unfortunately, many people who support very warlike policies and have for many years uh, towards Venezuela are in the poll position. But I think in the letter you just read, that's one example, and the demonstrations that we've seen around the country at Venezuelan consulates in support of the Bolivarian Revolution, that's another example. And there have been some voices in Congress and in other places. So I believe there, there is strong voices here in the United States opposed to intervention. Talking about Congress and talking about some voices in the Congress, we're talking about Tulsi uh, Gabbard. She is a representative and uh, she's a presidential candidate. And she uh, said in Twitter, and I quote, the United States needs to stay out of Venezuela. Let the Venezuelan people determine their future. We do not want other countries to choose our leaders. So, we have to stop trying to choose theirs. So clearly, we are saying uh, this is an intervention. Absolutely. I think Tulsi Gabbard's statement really is the strongest statement we've seen from anyone in Congress. It's certainly very consistent with her belief, but I think, you know, seeing her run for president is also consistent with the idea that there is a constituency of people who want to see a type of politics, a type of foreign policy that embraces non-interventionism. Another um, Twitter. This one is from Ro Kenner. He's a representative from California, and he says in Twitter, with respect to Senator Durbin, that he has approved what the President uh, Trump was doing, he said the U.S. should not anoint the leader of the opposition in Venezuela during an internal polarized conflict. Let us support Uruguay, Mexico, and the Vatican set for, for a negotiated settlement and the end of sanctions that are making the hyperinflation worse. I think that's a very important statement, first and foremost, because it acknowledges the role of sanctions. I mean, one of the biggest blind spots in U.S. foreign policy is this idea that sanctions somehow do not hurt the people. Uh, we, I, I can remember this going back all the way to President Clinton and Operation Desert Fox in Iraq. There's always this thing that, well, sanctions, they're only on the, the rulers, they're only on the leaders. But what we've seen in Iraq, what we've seen in Venezuela, what we saw previously in Syria, what we've seen in many countries all around the world is that sanctions actually primarily hurt average everyday people. And for Ro Khanna to recognize that, that's something that almost no person in Congress has ever recognized. And he's a very influential congressman. He's from Silicon Valley, for instance. So many of his supporters are some of the most influential people. And he's been very outspoken, whether it be the war in Yemen uh, and other issues, the general, uh, the War Powers Act, on really starting to at least question, if not roll back, at least start to question this U.S. foreign policy of being the world police. Jill Stein, she was a presidential candidate in the last election of 2016. She was for the Green Party. And she wrote also in Twitter, reacting to that, 
which I would like to get your, your comments. She said, the, the Democrats are backing Trump on regime change in Venezuela, just like they backed disasters in Afghanistan, Iraq, Honduras, Libya, Syria, Ukraine, and Yemen. When it comes to regime change, the two parties, the two parties of war and Wall Street are still marching in lockstep. I think that Ms. Stein is 100% right. I mean, we saw the House Foreign Relations Committee put out a bipartisan joint statement. Elliot Engel, for instance, a Democrat. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a very influential uh, Democrat. And certainly we've seen on the Republican side, Marco Rubio and others. But I think we've seen consistently from Democrats, and I think that Ms. Stein is right going back in time. I mean, everyone now says, oh, well, we were against the Iraq war. The reality is, is that at the time, and I was an activist at that time, you know, half the Senate voted for the war in Iraq. Liberal magazines like The New Yorker were for the war in Iraq. And I think we're seeing the same thing here yet again, that much of the liberal political establishment has essentially made a Faustian bargain with the U.S. ruling elite, that if you allow us to offer some criticisms of corporate America, to offer some criticisms of income inequality, some criticisms of the treatment of minorities here in the United States, we'll stick with you and we will remain in lockstep as it concerns the foreign policy issues. And I think it really is a devil's bargain. And here we are yet again seeing that there is a bipartisan consensus, despite the fact that there is not actually, when you look at the polls, a bipartisan consensus among voters. And both major parties, the vast majority of voters, want to see less intervention, which is exactly why Donald Trump ran on a platform that was promising less intervention. Barack Obama ran on a platform promising less intervention. I mean, even if people aren't doing what they say they are going to, it's not popular to go around the world. I mean, even George W. Bush, when he ran in 2000, said, I'm not a nation builder. I don't want to intervene abroad. Now, of course, that was all completely fake. But I think we can see amongst voters, there is not a bipartisan consensus. But unfortunately, amongst the representatives there is. If you analyze uh, that uh, statement of Jill Stein, it really goes or put in question the backbone of the U.S. quote unquote democracy. Mm -hmm. Because you remember that Noam Chomsky is saying that in the U.S. there are no two political parties. There's just yeah, one yeah. political party, the business party. If we're talking that we are just witnessing that two parties are acting at one at this stage. Is this a democratic system? Because, for example, Jean Stein, that was running for president, she was not giving any space in the media. She was getting a minimal uh, amount, percentage of voters. So the one party, mm -hmm. the business party, do not let third parties or more parties to participate. Are we in the middle of a country with a democracy or what? I mean, I, I've said that this is an oligarchy with some democratic features, essentially. I mean, I think when you look at the reality, I mean, this is the deep irony of the United States having the gall to proclaim on Venezuelan democracy. I mean, you look at just the last presidential election year where the Republican Party, using a system called cross-check, actually purged three million primarily black and Latino voters, also Asians, from the rolls before it even started. Uh, as you've also mentioned, I mean, you have the issue of uh, the exclusion from debates of third parties, which is there's no law, there's no rule, but the two parties have actually ganged up and combined with the big media companies to keep all the third parties out of the debates. There's the issue of money, as it were. There's the issue of voter uh, of, of how you get on the ballot. I mean, in each different state, there are actually different rules about how a presidential candidate can actually get on the ballot so people can vote for you. Some states, they're good states, they make it very easy. Some states, like, say, California, you have to get hundreds of thousands of signatures in just a few weeks, which means unless you're a billionaire and can pay thousands of people, there's really no way that you can uh, have the opportunity to really be on the ballot and be seen. I mean, it's very, very difficult unless you have a very strong grassroots movement. And so I think we've seen time and time again that the political spectrum in the country is artificially narrowed. Uh, and this is done deliberately by the two major parties and by the media to really prevent there being a real, true democratic discussion. And I think that really the United States has to question much more seriously, or I think the citizens of the United States need to question much more seriously why money seems to actually matter more than any other factor in the viability of any politician on the political scene. Talking about the Trump policy towards Latin America, we were just watching a comment of uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the now president of Brazil, which is very close to President Trump, mm -hmm. accused by many as a fascist. Not Trump, I mean Bolsonaro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's meeting with a Uruguayan candidate now in, da in Davos. And his quote by O Globo 
meaning that it's the uh, largest media in, in part in Brazil, are saying Bolsonaro to the Uruguayan candidate, you have to help us to eliminate the left in Uruguay. And the Uruguayan candidate says to him, uh, don't worry, I'm going to do half of that work because, and he forgot, he forgot Bolivia, he said, because the only leftovers of the left is Venezuela and Uruguay. And, and we're talking about also uh, Bolivia. If Bolsonaro has a direct connection with Trump, we can assume that the idea here wipe out totally the progressive governments and progressive movements in Latin America. Is that what's going on? Is that what was trying to be accomplished with that coup in Venezuela? I think that's absolutely what's going on. I think the United States, which had turned its attention to the Middle East, turns its attention to Asia, is, has been looking for an opportunity to really roll back the progressive governments inside of Latin America. They haven't had the opportunity. They've either been bogged down or I think it just hasn't seemed realistic. But I think what we've seen, I mean, you know, you can just look at the Colombian election, for instance, where the United States was going out of its way not only to undermine the peace process, but to pretty much openly back Mr. Ivan Duque in that election. And I mean, extreme far right pro paramilitary government. The same thing with Jair Bolsonaro. I mean, some of Trump's advisors were even there helping him run for office. But even before he was uh, elected as a candidate, you could see from the right-wing sectors in the United States that they were heavily excited to have him in there. And look at his rhetoric. I mean, this is someone who praised the death squads that are essentially running the favelas in Rio de Janeiro now, these off-duty police officers killing thousands of people every year. I mean, you've got a situation that I think is very concerning. I, I mean, I think, you know, almost shades of Alberto Fujimori, really, uh, in the history of Latin America, where we have many of these governments that are coming into power that are openly willing to use paramilitaries, to use death squads, to use extremely violent rhetoric, and all of it is directed towards the left, which is very similar, of course, to the security partnerships, so-called security partnerships, the United States made in the 1970s and the 1980s inside of Latin America, the dirty wars, Argentina, Chile. I mean, we can think of so many different places, Central America, where these were the policies, mass deaths, death squads, civil wars, and it seems that the United States States is trying to bring similar forces back into power, and I think that's concerning, but since the Monroe Doctrine, they've said we control this entire hemisphere, and certainly it was the Bolivarian movement, uh, uh, the Workers' Party in Brazil, uh, the, the, the Evo Morales government in Bolivia, and many others that were able to sort of finally push back against that and say Latin America is going to be self-determining. I think that's very, very scary for U.S. ruling elites. Here in the States, and um, some figures that are very much concerning for many people because President Trump is selling or trying to sell that the U.S. is leaving an economic boom. Figures. 80% of the American workers, not only federal workers, American workers live paycheck to paycheck. 50% of American workers just have no money saved, not even $500. 25% of American workers not even makes ends meet. We're seeing long lines of federal workers trying to get from food banks their food because they don't have enough money to survive this over a month situation. When Trump is mentioning that there is an economic boom, two questions, is there an economic boom? And if there is an economic boom, for whom is an economic boom? Because, I'm sorry, one in five Americans are being touched by this shutdown? Well, I think it's a great question because the reality is, is if there's an economic boom, depends on who you are. If you're a billionaire, absolutely. These are number one boom times. The Trump tax cuts put more money in your pocket. It's all looking good. It's all looking rosy for you. I think the average everyday American worker, 51 million people in the United States cannot, do not make enough money to meet their daily expenses. And if anything, the shutdown, ironically enough, is actually exposing this because we're starting to see how many tens of millions of people actually won't be able to live without, for instance, food assistance, which could run out in March, without, for instance, rental assistance, which by the end of February, over 2.2 million people could be getting evicted from their homes because they'll lose their rental assistance from the federal government. I've talked to farmers, for instance, all around this country who are unable to get payments from the USDA. And so we're seeing over and over and over again, uh, if this shutdown sort of in sector after sector, that the reality of this great economic boom in this very wealthy country is really only true for a very small minority of people. 
people and quite frankly government action is really the difference between keeping a lot of people uh, with their head above water or them really drowning in this economic circumstances. And have you seen that uh, recently there was a comment very much uh, that provoke an uproar from the Secretary of Commerce, we're talking about Wilmer Ross, he been asked, but what about the people who are suffering? We're talking about, as you said, millions and millions of Americans because of President Trump shut down because he's saying, if you don't give me the money for my wall, I'm going to shut the government. So he is absolutely in the right responsible of that. So Wilbur Ross is saying, being asked if people are suffering, what's his reaction? He said, I don't understand why, because they can get a loan. And the comment was, this guy is totally divorced from average American. Is he representative of the divorce of Trump government and the American public? I would say Wilbur Ross is very representative. I think he's worth something like $325 million. He's this major worldwide businessman. He actually made his money on what's known as buying distressed assets. So he's the guy who goes around to failing companies, buys them, strips them down, and then sells them to other people. So, I mean, not only is he in his personal wealth, I think, indicative in the divide, but even the way he made his money, I think, is indicative of this sort of Wall Street hedge fund pirate atmosphere that has really laid waste to large subsets of the economy. And I think you add him with the rest of this just absurd cast of characters. Steve Mnuchin, same thing. I mean, this is someone who uh, is not only a Goldman Sachs alumni, but if you certainly believe the press, he's only a high-ranking official at Goldman Sachs because his father was. Uh, he also played a major role in the foreclosure crisis uh, in the state of California. By the way, Kamala Harris, Democratic presidential candidate, actually let him off the hook for fraudulently foreclosing on thousands of people. But be that as it may, Trump has really stocked his cabinet with all these people who have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and probably never been to a grocery store, I, I think probably almost never drive their own cars, I mean, have almost no experience beyond maybe 30 or 40 years ago, which of course they all still talk about, you know, in 1972 when I was a regular person. Uh, for 30 or 40 years, they've been living in the rarefied air of Manhattan penthouses and, you know, giant mansions and the like. And I think it's really broadly indicative of the income inequality in this country. So in some ways, it might be very appropriate for the United States to have this kind of administration because it is reflective of so many of the problems of this country, which is are the huge amount of wealth concentrated in a tiny amount of hands. There is this joke that shows that this man or woman, to be politically correct in terms of sex, uh, his or she is coming back home and she or he is finding his or her spouse cheating mm. to her or to him on a sofa. Solution? selling the sofa. So the solution of the situation in Central America and the U.S. is selling the sofa, building a wall. Why do not the American people demand to go to the roots of this problem, that is the involvement of the U.S. in the life of Central America that is creating that massive exodus? And the next step is what is in agreement is the massive modern slavery of Hispanics coming to the U.S. Why the American people don't have the curiosity or the minimum commitment to humanity to let see that in their country they are creating modern slavery that benefit on top of that they are demonizing it. I think people have become victim to the demonization. I mean, I think the United States is a country that, you know, is historically built on, on white supremacy, on settler colonialism, and I don't think it's ever really that difficult to whip up hatred against anyone who seems to be a foreigner, who seems to be an outsider, and to really make them the centerpiece and the blame for all of your problems. And I think that we've seen really pretty consistently since the mid-1990s when we had uh, the rise of NAFTA, when we had the opening up even more of the WTO, uh, giving most favored nation status to China, and different things that really did affect people's lives is like immediately this anti-immigrant bigotry went into overdrive. And I mean, you look even three or four years ago, uh, major news media using the term uh, illegal immigrant as opposed to undocumented and things that maybe seem small, but I think start to, to build in the subconscious. So I think America's in an interesting spot where there are a number of people who I think have just fallen prey to these people are here to, you know, take something from us. So we are against them. And I think we certainly uh, the reason we aren't seeing movement from a lot of people 
people is they're just trapped by a, a fake knowledge of what's going on and they need to have the myths debunked. And I think on the other hand, you have a number of people who do want to go to the roots, who do want to start to push for comprehensive immigration reform, the calls around abolish ICE. But then the challenge becomes is that the Democratic Party, which is the political vessel for a lot of those individuals' hopes and dreams, is actually resistant to looking at these policies because, again, they've made this Faustian bargain where we can talk about issues domestically, internally, in a more progressive way, but we have to be on the same page internationally. And I don't think many of the people in the leadership of the Democratic Party really want to truly recognize that the only way to approach this would be, from my perspective, a Marshall Plan for Central America, uh, really to help lift those countries up and empower them economically so people don't find the need to leave. I mean, we can sell billions and billions of dollars to ultra-rich countries all around the world, but we can't help Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, Honduras. It doesn't make any sense at all. But I think really this is another issue, similar to the issue of intervention, where there is more sentiment to really try to deal with these issues at their root, but we see the political leaders are very resistant to that. Eugene Perrier, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.